it in can you hear me hi hi i uh, i guess i am the next speaker so, oh hi yeah yes, uh, i do. want to check my slide oh okay i can't hear i think they're getting started so Okay. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, sh should I get started? Uh, due to our attendees are all having the coffee break outside, let's wait for another one minute. Thank you. Yeah, sounds good. Should I turn on my video? In this section, we are going to invite our section chair from Harper University. Please give a warm applause to our section chair, our Anora Enshu. Let's welcome. Thanks, and hello, everyone. Um, so hope you had a nice break. Let's get started with the first set of contributor talks here. Um, so the rules stay the same throughout this talk. Uh, we have 10 minutes for each talk for 30 minutes. Uh, it's six minutes for the speaker and four minutes for Q&A. Also, uh, please feel free to ask any questions on the Q&A box here or send it on the chat. I will be monitoring those. Let's see. So I, I think uh, the first speaker is already here. Uh, if uh, if the other speakers of uh, the remaining two talks are in the attendees uh, list, then please change yourself as a panelist. All right. So let's get started. And we have Taiga Hirokara uh, speaking about certified everlasting zero knowledge proof for QMA. Taiga, please go ahead. Thank you for your introduction. My name is Taiga Hiroka. In this talk, I talk about certified everlasting the knowledge proof of QMA. This work is joint work with Tomoki Moremai, John Shimaki, and Takashi Amakawa. In this talk, I will consider the knowledge proof of QMA. In the knowledge proof of QMA, a prover can convince a verifier that the instance X is S instance without revealing any information beyond the fact that the instance X is its instance. More formally, in the knowledge proof of QMA, the following three properties hold. The first property is completeness. This guarantees that when the instance X is its instance and the protocol is executed honestly, the verifier accepts with high probability. The second property is statistical standardness. This guarantees that when the instance X is no instance, the verifier rejects with high probability. For any unbounded malicious prover that tries to make the verifier accept. The third property is computational zero knowledge. This intuitively guarantees that no quantum polynomial time malicious verifier learns anything beyond the fact that the instance X is its instance. Although the knowledge proof of QMA satisfies these three, these three properties, computational zero knowledge has a risk. In fact, new algorithms or improvements of computers may solve the problem underlying the security of computational zero knowledge. So computational zero knowledge does not necessarily guarantee a long-term security. In other words, in computational zero knowledge, a malicious verifier may obtain information beyond the fact that the instance X is a S instance in the future. So this is, und this is undesirable. One way to resolve the problem is to use zero knowledge proof for QMA 
with statistical zero knowledge. In a protocol with statistical zero knowledge, the security holds against unbounded malicious verifier. So the security will never break, break in the future. However, it is believed that we cannot construct the knowledge proof for QMA with statistical sandness and statistical zero knowledge at the same time. So if the protocol satisfies statistical soundness, the knowledge property must be computational one. And thus a malicious verifier may obtain information beyond the fact that the instance X is this instance. So our question in this work is as follows. Can we construct the knowledge proof for QMA where the zero knowledge property holds in a long term without compromising statistical soundness? Note that this question was originally posed by Broadband and Islam in TCC 2020. In our work, we resolve this question affirmatively. For that, first, we introduce a new notion of zero knowledge property, which we call certified everlasting zero knowledge. And then, construct zero knowledge proof for QMA with statistical soundness and certified everlasting zero knowledge at the same time. Now, I will explain an intuitive definition of certified everlasting zero knowledge. In a protocol with certified everlasting zero knowledge, a malicious verifier can issue a certificate, which shows that he deletes the information received from the prover. The prover can check whether the certificate is valid or not using high internal information. When the certificate is valid, even if the verifier's computing power becomes unbounded after that, he cannot obtain information beyond the fact that the instance X is this instance. This is the intuitive definition of certified everlasting zero knowledge. So in the certified everlasting zero knowledge, the security will never break in the future when the certificate is valid. Note that certified everlasting zero knowledge does not guarantee any security when the certificate is not valid. However, the prover can prevent the malicious verifier from refusing to output a valid certificate by penalizing the malicious verifier. So we believe that this security is still meaningful. Finally, I will explain an outline of our construction. To construct certified everlasting zero knowledge proof for QMA, we introduce a new quantum commitment with a new hiding property, which we call certified everlasting hiding. In this hiding, a malicious receiver can issue a certificate which shows that he deletes the quantum commitment. When the certificate is valid, even if the receiver's computing power becomes unbounded after that, he cannot obtain the committed value. We construct this quantum commitment from these cryptographic primitives. And by using this quantum commitment, we construct certified everlasting zero knowledge proof for QMA. But for the time constraint, we, I cannot explain the detail of our constructions. So if you are interested in our, uh, the detail of our construction, Please read our paper or see my talk uploaded in YouTube. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Tiger. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? Also, by the way, it seems we may have a lot of time because I don't see any speakers from are there two talks? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, do you have any backup slide which goes for another 20 minutes? <laughs> backup slide? <laughs> just, just um, yeah, uh, I, I, I have uh, the construction of this, but so. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Uh, so, once more, any question from the audience? If not, then I will. I can ask one very basic one, if you don't mind. So one basic question is, I think I missed it. What is the verifier supposed to certify? Uh, I think it went a bit fast, so I could not follow. 
So, so your question is about the definition of certified powerlifting the knowledge. Uh, yes. Uh, what is the? Uh, you said something about verified is supposed to certify something, but I missed that. Ah, uh, verifier, is... verifier. Uh, this certificate shows that the verifier deletes the information received from the prover. Okay. So, I see. so certificate shows that he deletes the information received from the prover. This is my answer. That okay? Okay. Okay. Got it. And uh, why does verifier have to be unbounded? Uh, sorry, if verifier can be unbounded, why is prover needed at all? Because I thought usually you need a prover if verifier is bounded and so on, right? Mm -hmm. So, why? So, um, I'm sorry, but what do you, you mean? I mean, for a computational task, uh, Usually, you need a verifier. You have a verifier whose polynomial time or so ah, ah, That's when you need a powerful yeah. proof. But if verifier yeah. is extremely powerful, then why do you need yeah. a powerful uh, proof? In, in an ordinary uh, formal definition of zero knowledge, zero knowledge is so formal definition is sorry. <laughs> ah, formal definition is as follows. Uh, in the real protocol, the uh, efficient verifier and the prover interact, and the efficient verifier output some quantum state, and the prover output uh, accept or reject. Okay, and in the ideal world, the simulator simulates this quantum state. Okay, this quantum state is uh, equal to low when the prover output accept. On the other hand, when the prover output reject. Uh, this quantum state is what? And uh, if there exists uh, efficient simulator uh, such that uh, exists statistically, indi statistically indistinguishable from low, low star, we say that the protocol satisfies certified everlasting zero knowledge. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so, so in some sense, um, when the certificate is valid, uh, certified everlasting zero knowledge becomes statistical zero knowledge. And I roughly, roughly speaking. Okay. That's the, okay. okay. Got it. Thanks. So, so the speaker from the uh, third talk is online, but there was one question in Q and A which I thought uh, I would run by here. So the question is, uh, sorry if I'm missing something, but why is it that the security is just everlasting? If the construction looks as I'm imagining it does, uh, if the verifier is unbounded during the protocol, but still certifiably deletes all the ciphertext, uh, wouldn't security be maintained? Uh, I'm not sure what they what he means, but uh, um, yeah, when the certificate is valid, even if the verifier they see bad competing part becomes unbounded. The security force in my definition. Okay. All right. Great. Thanks. So we'll move to the next talk, uh, which is by by Luo Wen uh, Chen, uh, and the talk is cryptography from pseudo random quantum states. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, great. Thanks for. Uh, invitation. Today I'm going to be talking about the recent work uh, on constructing quantum cryptography from pseudo-random quantum states and by extension warm pulse. Um, so this is going to be joint work with Pravon Jianna and Henry Yuan. Okay, so let me start my talk by um, briefly um, so let me start my talk with the following question. Um, so let's say you are given um, uh, any, take any cryptography that you like, AES, SHA-3, RSA, uh, so these are like assumptions, lattices, or even concrete schemes like TLS. Can we actually prove security of these schemes? It turns out, um, after decades of cryptographic research, now we know that if you have any unconditional computational security proof, this would imply uh, the existence of 
a certain object called one-way function. And in particular, you will be able to prove that P not equals MP and therefore win a million dollars, which is unlikely. Um, so the focus of the talk today is going to be on quantum cryptography, meaning um, where the protocols, uh, where the honest parties also have quantum capabilities. And prior to our work, um, almost all non-quantum crypto all assume uh, some assumption that already implies one-way functions, um, or uh, it is uh, information theoretically secure. And as a corollary of our work, combined with the prior work with, of Kreshmer, we show that P versus MP is essentially independent for a broad class of quantum cryptography. And therefore, there are no such barrier for proving the security for a lot of quantum cryptography protocols. OK, so a more concretely, Kreshmer showed that, unlike classically, um, there is a quantum oracle relative to which p equals mp, but quantum pseudo-randomness of some form still exists. In this work, we show that how the same form of quantum pseudo-randomness suffices for constructing quantum commitment schemes and quantum one-time encryption. And furthermore, we show how to combine this with the prior work constructing multi-party secure computations from commitment to get, um, to get also MPC but from quantum commitment. So a corollary of this is that even if P equals MP, this does not rule out any quantum cryptography that you can do with MPC. So a bit more formally, uh, the pseudorandomness that we consider is this object introduced by Jido and Song in 20, uh, 2018. It's called pseudorandom state generator. Uh, on a high level, it's the same as PRG, but instead of mapping a seed to a, uh, a classical string that is longer, it instead maps it to a qubit a quantum state that is n qubits long. So we show that if the output length is a little bit more than two log lambda, where the lambda is the input length, then we can get statistically binding commitments. And if the output length is um, super logarithmic, then this suffices for constructing one-time encryption for arbitrarily long polynomial length messages. So the main technical contribution of our work is that we define a pseudorandom function analog of pseudorandom states called pseudorandom function-like states, or PRFS. And using this as an uh, important intermediate um, technical tool, we show how to start from PRS to construct PRFS, but with the input length very short, which uh, in the end suffices to construct commitment and encryptions, and therefore MPC, as I described uh, in the last slide. And we also know that this new PRFS object that we introduced seems to be as useful as uh, PRF classically. In particular, you can maybe use it um, to instantiate a lot of classical crypto where using PRF, but instead you instantiate it with PRF. Okay, so let me, uh, before I wrap up my talk, let me talk about what are the candidate quantum pseudorandomness. So the first candidate comes from wormhole dynamics so this is uh, one proposal proposed by Ulan, Pfefferman, and Mazzarani in 2020, where um, they have a concrete proposal that is based on uh, how uh, the wormhole Hamiltonian. Um, and uh, another pro uh, candidate is basically random quantum circuit. And this is uh, an object that is already being considered by quantum supremacy literature and also literature on black holes. Uh, and one might even hope to uh, have quantum cryptography that can be implemented on near-term quantum devices uh, from these quantum circuits. So let me um, mention some open directions. So can we get some evidence that these are secure or insecure? Can we get some formal evidence that these candidates are also independent of one-way functions? Um, so our work really is initiating this new direction of considering quantum cryptography uh, and their relationship with quantum computational harness, um, in our case, quantum pseudo-randomness. Uh, um, so, so for our parameters, there is still a, a small parameter range 
where the parameter means upper length, where we don't know whether we can get statistical constructions, nor do we know whether it is useful for uh, cryptography. So one open question is, can we close this gap further? The other question is, uh, are there any other quantum, interesting quantum harness that lies beyond PRS? And let me briefly mention that there is an upcoming work of ours uh, that is going to be posted soon, which where we give some partial progress on these two questions, and we also try to give a minimal primitive. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Luan. Uh, any questions from the audience? Okay, so while someone uh, brings up a question, uh, I have one. It's a very high-level question. I mean, it's uh, probably extremely high-level. So you made you said the sentence that p equals np doesn't rule out quantum cryptography, which was probably the main message of this talk. Is that correct? Right, right, right. In fact, even p equals QMA does not rule out quantum cryptography. Uh, so. Uh, uh, why should someone be surprised by that? Because we know BBIT4 protocols, which are unconditionally secure. I mean, oh, right, right, right. But I guess we, indeed, this is not new to our work, but we are like uh, formally showing that a lot of uh, a broad class of cryptography, like encryption, um, commitment, OT, MPC, none of this um, requires one way functions, really. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. Uh, any question from the audience again? Okay, so let me ask one more. Uh, and sure. uh, so um, you mentioned random quantum circuits. So uh, is there any connection between pseudo random states and designs? Uh, Are pseudo random states and what? And, uh, you know, unitary designs or state designs? Oh, right, 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 right. Yeah. So pseudo random states, their security says that it needs to look like how random for any polynomial copies, number of mm -hmm. copies, where mm -hmm. T designs are, looks like how random states statistically up to T, but mm -hmm. there is no guarantee once you give out T plus one copies. Oh, I see. Okay, so, so this the- pseudo random states, if it's secure, for T copies, it will always be secure for T plus one copy. Okay. Uh, and is the security also in terms of the uh, like statistical versus computational distribution? Um, so the definition talks about computational PRS, but you okay. can also consider statistical. And uh, the only parameter that we know how to construct statistical PRS is if the alpha length is some constant times log info length, where the constant is like a little bit less than one. So point three, I'm not exactly sure what's the right constant here. Mm -hmm. But it's less than what. I see. Okay. Thanks so much. So okay. thanks. Uh, let, me, let me see if there are any questions. Maybe not. Um, A room from our professor. Oh, yes, please. Uh, hi. Hi, Lord. Uh, yeah. So uh, I guess following Anurag's question, and also following what you mentioned that even with uh, P equal to QMA, uh, let it still be quantum cryptography. So I just want to make a distinction between information theoretical harness and the computational harness. Like for QKD, then you re you actually rely on information theoretical. Uh, right. Right. But we know that all of these objects, encryption, OT, commitments, none of this can be information theoretically secure, even if you use quantum mechanics right but prs it feels like uh like what you said the computational quantum computational harness because if you have unbounded time unbounded copy then you can actually break it uh so right. in the world where p equal to qma is there still a hope for some kind of quantum computational harness or we actually need to rely on just information theoretical harness well, that's what we demonstrated. Even if P equals QMA, there are still meaningful computational harness like quantum pseudo random states. That, well, that's what Krashmer showed. Um, in principle, they could still exist. Um, in a, so I'm not sure if that answers the question. 
So formally, it's saying that um, even if I give you an oracle that solves every QMA decision problem, you still you might not be able to break to the random states because to break a pseudo random state, that's uh, you cannot um, capture that as a decision problem. I see. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Is there any question in the room? Okay. So in the room so far that we have no more question. Is there any question online for the attendees? Yes, I see a question by Ernest. Uh, so uh, it's in the Q&A. Uh, Luan, you are free to you free to read it, but I'll s s uh, spell it out. So I didn't precisely follow the claims regarding the connection to P versus NP. Is the existence of pseudo random states known to not imply P not equal to NP or is it just not known to imply P not equal to NP? Um, it is a little bit of known to not imply P for NP. So let me go back. Um, so it, w what we have really is a back box separation where there is a quantum oracle relative to which P equals NP, in fact, P equals QMA, but yes, to the random states exist. So what this means is that there is no hope of um, uh, proving, um, so for example, if to the random state exists, then P not equal QMA in a black box way or in a relativizing way. So there is a barrier to proving this. And indeed, we don't know how to get around this barrier uh, as far as we are concerned. And for me personally, um, I also don't don't know how to how to um, how to prove it. But there there are formal evidence that that there is a barrier. So this this, this is basically a black box separation, uh, the same black box separation in the classical setting as. Uh, you know, one-way function versus collision resistance, so on and so forth. Great, thank you so much. So, uh, thanks a lot to the two speakers of this session. Unfortunately, we didn't get to see one of the talks, but I'm sure you'll enjoy the online video. So, that concludes the session, and the next one is uh, in a while. Yeah. Okay. Oh, th thanks to Professor Anorak leading and uh, thanks to our speakers for sharing. And uh, now that we are going to have a lunch break to 3 p.m. Taipei time, and you are very welcome to join the online networking in discussion lunch in the next in event X. So please take a break to the 3 p.m. Taipei time and participate in the next section of the conference. Thank you, everybody's joining.